Time magazine came out this week with the most interesting cover. The cover had on it 2020, the year that we're in. But no, below that, it simply said, worst period, year period, ever period. 2020, worst year ever. Oh my, nobody saw this coming our way, what's taking place, what's going on in our country, around the world, which is ironic to me because it's the year 2020. And 2020 speaks of good vision, perfect vision, seeing things clearly. But nobody saw what this year has brought to us. It's a year, we are told, that is going to keep getting a little darker and more grimly as we move into Christmas Day and for the weeks beyond. Yep. Has there ever been a Christmas season like this where there is disruption and division and danger where some would say that Political leaders are acting like dictators. And, and, and we, we are being sheeple, being told where to go, what to do, how to be. People are being turned into sheeple, they say. So a year of darkness and danger, yep. Depression, division, divisiveness. A year of dictatorial decrees and mandates and all of that, you see. Has there ever been a Christmas like this one? Some would say there's never been a Christmas like this. But I would say, I'm not so sure about that. I think there's one that's very similar in many ways. Turn to Luke chapter 2 with me. And let's take a look at the first Christmas. Luke chapter 2. Talk about people being fatigued and overtaxed. People being told what to do and mandates coming their way dictatorially from thousands of miles from where they were living in the story that is before us today. Ah, lots of controversy, division, fear, tensions. We read in Luke chapter 2, and it came to pass in those days there went out a decree, a mandate from Dr. Fucci, no, uh, from Caesar Augustus. There in Rome, Caesar Augustus, his given name, his birth name was Gaius Octavius. But when he became the leader of the Roman Empire. He went before the Senate and said, I want to have a different title, a different name, a different moniker than Gaius Octavius. So they gave him the name of his great uncle, Julius Caesar. They gave to Octavius the name Caesar. And they said, We'll call you Caesar King. He said, you know, King seems to be sort of limiting. You can have a king of a nation, he was implying, without that person being in control of the nation. Ask the English about that with Queen Elizabeth. Well, how about dictator, they said. No... That doesn't have the gravitas or the weight, Octavius declared. 
Well, how about emperor? Mm. And then somebody in the Senate, true story, said, how about Augustus? The word August, Augustus mean, means August one or divine one. He says, I like that. Divine one. That's me. Caesar, the divine one. And in that began the whole concept of worshiping the Caesar of Rome as a god. Caesar Augustus did that. He thought that he was high and mighty, all-powerful Caesar Augustus. It was in his year that all the world should be taxed by his decree, verse 1. He gave a decree from, Washington D, from Rome. He gave a decree. This is what's going to happen. Everybody is going to be taxed. This was a new idea, a new concept of a whole empire tax, a forced tax. And you're going to have to go to the place of your family origin to pay the tax. We're doing a census. We're counting the people. We're organizing the population. And we're taxing everybody by sending you to the hometown or for where your family came from to register there. And I'm sure that Caesar thought, my, oh my, I simply give a decree and everybody falls into line. And they did. Throughout the empire, everybody obeyed the decree and they made their way to their family ancestral homeland or home city or home territory so my talk about feeling taxed or being dictated to or going through something that you might say that's an overreach governmentally or whatever it might be it was in that year Caesar Augustus made a decree that the whole world should be taxed and he thought he was all-powerful, that he had immense power to do just that. Now, this taxing, verse 2, was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. Parenthetically, Cyrenius, this was a scripture, Luke 2, verse 2, that was used for many, many years to refute the infallibility of the Bible because historical records were clear that Cyrenius didn't take over the area of Syria, the region politically. He wasn't in power until around the year 7 AD. So if he wasn't in power until 7 AD, how could it be that the taxing that took place that relates to our story in harmony with Caesar Augustus' degree, how could that be? How could that be if, if the year was 7 AD, but this is before that? Well, then about 35 years ago, they uncovered a document in an archaeological dig that made mention of Cyrenius that he had two terms of service. Yes, from 7 A.D. to 9 A.D. was one. But before that, before that, 10 years earlier, he had a first term, we might say, an earlier rule. And so once again, all the Bible critics that said, oh, the Bible is fallible and full of error, were proved to be wrong, as is always the case. Just give it enough time and history will verify, veracitate what it says in this book. So the world is being taxed. Caesar Augustus gives this decree, we are told. And they all went to be taxed, everyone to his city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David. 
He went there to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child or ready to pop. <laughs> and it was so that while they were there in Bethlehem for the taxing, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in a swaddling cloth, swaddling uh, cloth, pardon me, laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. As Caesar thinks that he's so powerful in reality, he's a puppet being played by God prophetically. You see, God had decreed already the true king, the great king, the only king in reality. He had decreed in Micah chapter 5 verse 2 that Messiah, when Messiah was to come, that he would be birthed in the city of Bethlehem, Micah 5 2. One of the prophecies that was given in the Old Testament concerning the first coming of Christ said, there, Bethlehem, the city of David. Why there? Because the promise was made to David by God that David would be the one, his family lineage would be the family that would bring forth Messiah. And David's city was Bethlehem. Interesting, Bethlehem means house of bread. What a perfect place for the bread of life to be birthed. Bethlehem, the house of bread. The problem was, well, Joseph and Mary are a hundred miles north of Bethlehem in Nazareth. Now the time for the babe to be born is at hand, and God has a problem, if you would. Hmm. Mary, carrying my son, bearing my son, Jesus, is in Nazareth. But the prophecy says that my son is to be born in Bethlehem. I know what I'll do, God would say. I'm going to play Caesar Augustus like a puppet. I'm going to pull his strings. And he's going to suddenly think, I know I'm going to tax the whole world because I can do it. I am Caesar Augustus. He thought that he was being powerful and authoritative, but the whole situation was just part of God's divine design, God's perfect plan to get Mary from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Now, in those days, that would be a good seven, eight-day journey. The roads were rough where there were roads. It was dangerous. There was thieves and robbers along the way, as Jesus talked about in the parable of the Good Samaritan, one that was traveling to Jerusalem in those days. And I'm sure the people were divided and ticked off and feeling blue and wondering how come we're being taxed to this degree. Caesar Augustus, who does he think he is? How come this is happening? But the decree of Caesar Augustus, his being in power and his taxing the people, putting a burden on them, and his decrees and mandates and all of the politics that surrounded him, you see, were all part of a divine plan for God to get done what God wanted to do, to get his son carried to the right place. So too with me and you. What's going on in any year, 2020, 2030, 1846, whatever it might be, God is on the throne and in control, doing what needs to be done to get his son where he wants his son to be. 
in the lives and the hearts and the situations of people like you and me, nations like ours, the world in totality. God is on the throne. He's in control. He knows what he's up to. You might say, this whole thing stinks, this whole coronavirus dealy bobber. You, you may even be one that is not sure of the, the, the validity of all of this, at least to the degree it's being talked about or mandated or what have you. You, you may be one that says, you know, these are dark days. Not only are our parties for the season limited and activities restricted, but, but also, you might say, I'm just kind of, I don't know, burned out, fatigued with, upset by the election that took place or is still taking place, depending on what your perspective is. You might feel overtaxed or under attack, but you need to know this that God is on the throne and God is in control and he's doing what needs to be done to move us as a nation, to move us as a church, to move us as a congregation, to move us individually, to move us to where he wants Christ to be, Christ who dwells in us, Christ in you, just like Christ was in Mary, quite literally, physically, she had to go through quite an ordeal. Traveling when she's ready to pop, when she's ready to deliver. Arduously, difficulty, people no doubt murmuring, and people upset, and, and, and the division amongst people, because in Jesus' day at this time, there were a bunch of people called the Zealots, who are saying, we're going to overthrow this government. We're going to kick these Romans out of here. We're going to send those Republicans or those Democrats packing. We'll do whatever it takes to get her done. There was great political division. And there was government overreach coming from Rome far away. And there was... arduous difficulties to be navigated through to make their way to the city of their family tree. But all the while, while there may have been zealots saying, we're not going to stand for this, and others saying, we don't like it, and we're being taxed. This isn't right. Why should we be put on such a journey in winter time, and Mary might say, and Joseph might say, we can't do that. We can't go a hundred miles on foot in this time of year, the rainy season, with dangers all about. We can't do that. That's not right. But God was in control, doing his thing. See, here's the thing. When we're going through days like we're going through, the season that we're in, we ought not to say, how can I get out of this? But rather we ought to say, what can I get out of this? Lord, what are you doing? Not how can I get out of this, what can I get out of this? Hmm. I'm not going to work out with a mask on. Is my new favorite excuse for not working out. <laughs> what can I get out of this? What's God doing? What's he up to? Somebody asked me, hey, how did you like the election? The outcome, the results. I said, I'm delighted my guy won. <laughs> You're saying, you voted for Biden? I didn't say that. I said, my guy won. Really, I mean that. My guy won. How so? Because my prayer, like yours too, 
was, Lord, here's how I'm thinking and here's what I'm feeling, but not my will, but thy will be done. And whoever you put in, whatever you decide to do, I'm good with that. No, I'm great with that. No, I'm elated about that. You do whatever it is that you want to do. No matter how taxing it might seem when they start saying your taxes are going up with this new regime. It doesn't matter. Lord, we've prayed. Lord, we want you to do whatever needs to be done to get us where we need to be. Individually, as a nation, as a culture, as a society, eschatologically, in light of Bible prophecy, Lord, we're looking for your coming. You're the King of kings, the Lord of lords. And certain things we know have to kick in, have to be in play before that great and glorious day when we hear him say, come up here. So God is setting things up all the time, like he did in this first Christmas story, to fulfill prophecy. Which means that as I watch things happen in 2020 or 2021 or in any year, any time, hey, I can murmur about it and say, I can't believe this. I can't understand how they could. This isn't right. That's a bummer. Murmur. You know, they murmured in Moses' day on their journey to the promised land. And when they murmured, I like that word, murmur, murmur, murmur. You know what happened when they murmured? Man, talk about despair and depression. The ground opened up and pulled them in, pulled them down. Man, if you want to get into a pit of depression, here's how you do it. Just start murmuring, murmur, murmur, murmur about that leader, those guys, these things, whatever it is, murmur, murmur. The ground opened up, murmur. Fire came down and burned those that were murmuring in that day. Most of you know the story. Murmur. Miriam was smitten with leprosy. It was eating at her because she was murmuring against the leader, Moses. Man, murmuring just eats you up, gnaws on you, takes chunks out of you, makes you leprous, you see, leprosy, murmuring. When you read the story of that congregation, those guys, the Israelites, making their way from Egypt to the land of destiny, whenever they murmured, it ended up horrible. I can either be a murmurer, I can murmur, or I can be murrick, M-Y-R-R-H-I-C, murrick. What's murrick? It means anything to do with mur, M-Y-R-R-H. What's mur? Well, it's Christmas time. You know what the wise guys came with to give to the king? Gold, frankincense, and mur. Myrrh, mm -hmm. myrrh, gold for a mighty king, frankincense for a ministering priest, and myrrh for a martyred prophet. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Yes, he's the king of kings. He's the great high priest. He's the prophet like no other who prophesied of his own death and demise and his resurrection too. Myrrh. Myrrh is interesting. I can murmur or I can murrick. It's a real word, by the way. I can put myrrh. It's called the balm of Gilead. It brings healing. Myrrh. It's what those Ishmaelite traders were carrying on the backs of their camels when those Ishmaelite traders came by and bought Joseph from Joseph's brothers. And thus, his life, Joseph's life, was saved. He was freed from the pit that he was going to be left in and taken out by caravanners who 
had camels loaded with myrrh, you see. Myrrh. In the book of Exodus, chapter 30, myrrh, myrrh, it's called a sweet spice. It's sweet. And it was used in the holy anointing oil for priests. Myrrh. Yeah. Rescuing Joseph, merchants of myrrh. Mm -hmm. Used by priests for anointing in ministry. Myrrh. The sweet smell of myrrh, you see. Esther. Remember Esther? There in chapter 2, she bathed her body, bathed herself every day for six months in myrrh to prepare her body for the king. Again, most of you know the story. The bride in the Song of Solomon is talked about as having the scent of myrrh, M-Y-R-R-H, myrrh, myrrh. It's what Joseph of Arimathea brought in John chapter 19 to embalm Jesus in. After Jesus died on the tree, Joseph brought myrrh to fragrant the dead body. Myrrh. How does myrrh come about? It's a part, it comes from a tree that is uniquely natively from Saudi Arabia. And the myrrh tree, the tree that produces myrrh, balsamic tree, to get the myrrh, you've got to poke it, you've got to pierce it until it bleeds. It's called bleeding the tree. The tree bleeds with this gum resin stuff. The, the tree is kind of difficult to approach in one way because it's one of the few trees in that genre of that uh, class that grows with thorns. It's a tree that is very thorny. And it's a tree that must be pierced repeatedly. And it bleeds this resin, this gum, which then is taken by those that are harvesting the myrrh. It's taken and it's allowed to harden over a period of time and then it is crushed to release the fragrance. I, I think you see the analogy. Jesus Christ, from the desert, if you would, he left his home in glory and came and dwelt among us. He wore a crown of thorns. He was pierced in his hands, his feet, his side, by nails and spear, my, oh, my, oh, my. But from that comes the healing balm of Gilead. From that comes our salvation, myrrh. And, and when myrrh is crushed, it releases its fragrance. I get to say, Lord, no matter what's going on in my life or around me, nationally, personally, Whatever it might be, I realize that ultimately this is your plan. Because I've prayed, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And once I realize that even though it might be piercing and thorny, even though it might be from the desert, you see, I realize out of this is going to come a sweet-smelling fragrance that allows this bride, for we are the bride of Christ, to have a scent, a smell that's appreciated by you. And that allows others who are around us to sense a difference in us, unlike what others might think, say, or do. We get to be different. We get to rejoice evermore. We get to, in everything, give thanks. We get to say, not how can I get out of this, but what can I get out of this? Lord, what are you up to? What are you doing? And Lord, whatever you're doing, I'm 100% in. I applaud you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. It might look different, seem different, be different than it's ever been before. It might look different, seem different, be different than it was previously. But Lord, whatever you're up to and you're on the throne, you see, I'm not going to murmur 
about anything. I'm not going to murmur as I watch Fox News or MSNBC or whatever. I'm just not going to sit and murmur, 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 even internally. Murmur, 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 murmur. If I do when I do, should I murmur, 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 I will go down into the pit of depression. I'll be smitten with leprosy. It's going to gnaw on me and eat at me. I'm going to be burned out, fire, fire from, from above, just burned out with the whole, I'll be grumpy and grouchy. I'll be the Grinch that stole Christmas, you see. But on the other hand, if I can say, Lord, you're up to something in this that's going to prove to be sweet. It's going to prove to be beautiful. It might require initially crushing or, 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 or bleeding, disruptive or disconcerting. But ultimately, I know, Lord, that it's going to be sweet, just like Mary Mary, making her journey, the first Christmas story. Could have been complaining the whole way about the government, about danger, about the stupidity of this whole thing, or whatever it might be. Fear, frustration, tension, robbers, whatever. But Mary never murmured. Joseph and Mary simply made their way. Okay, this is what we're to do. No doubt they didn't know why, but we do. Matthew's account of the same story says that it was to fulfill the Scripture, that the Scriptures might be fulfilled. That God's story God's plan might be worked out, you see. I have found in my observation of my own life and people and watching over a lot of years now that people are motivated to move forward to move on, to move ahead, to move at all. People are motivated by one of two things. Either inspiration, they're inspired to move, or tribulation, they're forced to move. Tribulation meaning troubles or trials. People get going again after being stuck in a rut through either inspiration Man, perhaps it's a word from the Word or the Holy Spirit writes on their heart or something takes place where you're inspired to get out of the rut and get going again. People are motivated through either inspiration or tribulation. It just becomes so difficult. A trial, a problem, a pressure, a bummer seemingly that you say, Lord, I'm here again. I haven't been walking as closely with you as I know that I ought to be. But Lord, I'm desperate. It's desperation, this tribulation. And now, Lord, I come to you again. I'm moving once more. See? That is why we, as I wrap this message up, or as Ben would say, descend the plane. But I think I mentioned this last time. My plane is a glider. It can glide for quite a while. But the reality is this. We can truly say joy in our world. The Lord has come. He's on the throne. He's in control. He knows what he's up to. Joy. And I have peace in my world. Peace on earth. Yes. Goodwill, which means God's will. Goodwill, God's will to men. I can say, I am so thrilled with what's happening. And I mean that. I'm so thrilled. What are you talking about politically? Or, or you're talking about 
medically with the coronavirus thing you see, or whether you're talking about stock market at 30,000 points, or whether you're talking about businesses closing down right and left. I don't care what side one takes or what perspective one has. Anyone can say, this is so sweet. If they'll understand that it's all about God moving Christ, the body of Christ, the people of Christ, where he wants them to be according to his divine plan, you see. So what do you say as we head into the Christmas season, as Christmas is now underway, that we don't be murmurers, grinches, grumpies, that we don't be those that are criticizing leaders or would-be leaders or we might think should be leaders or whatever it is politically, that we might just put all that away and say, I'm not, I'm not going there. I'm not doing that. God's on the throne. We prayed, Lord, your will be done in this, that, or the other, whatever it is. And Lord, I'm good with whatever you're doing. You might recall the story of Ruth. How Naomi, when she came back to Bethlehem, 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 she said, don't call me Naomi anymore. Call me what? Mara, which means bitter. I'm bitter. Mara. It's the same word of myrrh. Myrrh is bitter until it's crushed. If you take the myrrh from the tree directly and put it in your mouth, it's the bitterest taste you'll ever taste. It has to first be dried out and then crushed before the sweetness emanates from it. Call me bitter. Man, my husband died and my sons have died and, and we were in a foreign land and my oh my and now we come back to Bethlehem and, and we have nothing. She said to those that knew her before they journeyed to a different country, don't call me Naomi any longer. I'm bitter. But we know the story. She didn't need to be because God was up to something big. You see, read the book of Ruth. God was up to something big in restoring her, in placing that family in the lineage of Messiah who was to come, you see, directly descending from that family. Bitter or better. I say let's go for better. For better or for worse. Let's go for better. Let's say this Christmas season, Lord, we're so grateful that you are in control. That you're calling the shots. That you're doing whatever you choose to do. I'm going to trust you and rest in you. And there'll be peace on earth, at least in my soul, to the degree that I do. Shall we pray? Father, I know this is a time that a lot of us have struggled with feeling taxed, fatigued, or disappointed, or manipulated, or whatever it might be. But Lord, today, on this Sunday, on this new day, we're here to say we do affirm that you are in control and on the throne. Give us a Merry Christmas. M-A-R-Y. Make us like Mary who just uttered praise in the Magnificat. Worshiped you. Spoke truth. Exalted your name and said so winsomely, be it unto me according to thy word. May that be what we say, Lord, be it unto me, to us, to our congregation, to the nation, 
to the world. Be it according to your word. And then, Lord, I pray that the sweet balm of Gilead would heal and soothe and set free that this might be a time for us to radiate peace and joy and to be a light in a time when so much of the world feels darkness and despair. Now bless us, Lord. Bless us with a refueling, with a refilling, and cause us to make our journey to the house of bread as we come to your table. Cause us, Lord, to be cleansed and healed as we come to the house of bread and come and die with the bread and the fruit of the vine. Oh, Lord, we're so blessed, so grateful that we know that you are our Father, that you're in control, and that your Son has paid for all of our murmurings and stupidities. I'm so grateful, Lord. The joy that we have, joy in our world, the peace on earth, peace in this place, in our hearts, because of you. How lost I would be, how confused I would be if it wasn't for you. So we're here to say thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Now set us free. Minister to us as we come and die.
the processing. those limbs whilst you tear them off. This 
<laughs> I haven't had so many spare parts in ages.
Vision shall be laid to waste. against 